kind and tender they're leading me in paths that I must try I'll have no fear for my Jesus walks beside me The dark clouds rise, they won't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and not of earth shall harm me, for I'm sheltered in arms of God. Soon I shall hear that call from heaven's portal. Come home, my child. This is the last mile you must trot. I'll fall asleep and awake in God's new heaven. For I'm sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise. They won't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and not of earth shall harm me, for I'm sheltered in the arms of God. God bless you boys. Well, we're glad to have with us tonight Brother Phil Kidd from up in Tennessee. We appreciate him so very much. He graduated and came here to college. And Brother Kidd, I believe you told me this was the first camp meeting that you ever, ever went to ever. and stepped on these grounds. It's been a blessing to him as well. How many got your Bibles? Hold them up real high. Wave them. You're going to pray for the preacher. You come on, brother, and help yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur. Turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 6 and verse number 1. Mark chapter number 6 and verse number 1. Such a great distinct honor to be back at the Greer Baptist Camp meeting. I appreciate Dr. Joe Arthur and all the labor and the work and prayer and sacrifice that him and the staff put in to this place. It's so good to see the tabernacle filled all the way to the back tonight. That is a good problem to have. Now we would appreciate it if you'd keep your seat. The bathrooms are broken, your car is blocked. So you might as well just sit back let your hair down and enjoy yourself tonight. So glad to be here and to be with many of you wonderful people that I've known for almost 40 years. And thank you so much for coming and being in the services tonight. Mark chapter number 6 and verse number 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach at the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Verse number 5. And he could there do no mighty work. And he could there do no mighty work. Yes, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. And here's why he couldn't do a mighty work in verse number 6. And he marveled. One of the only times Jesus marveled in his earthly ministry. And he marveled because of their unbelief. 
and went round about the villages teaching. Now for those of you that know the setting of the story, you're aware that Jesus has begun his earthly ministry. And he's going back to his own country, his own town, his own dwelling where his family was and where he was raised. And he had within his mind and heart, he had an idea to do some great, wonderful, mighty, miraculous works in his own town and around his own countrymen. But in spite of the fact that Jesus had a great work that he planned on doing there, the Bible said that he was hindered from doing such because of their unbelief. If I could bring this down into modern day terminology, I think I would simply say, somebody put the brakes on. Somebody stopped Jesus from doing what he really planned on doing when he got there. I've often wondered what miracles would be recorded in Mark chapter 6 had when he got there, everybody would have just taken the brakes off and let him be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I wondered what would be recorded about lives being changed, homes being salvaged, souls being saved, and futures turned around. But all of that was hindered and put on the back burner because somebody put the brakes on. So I want to preach tonight with the help of God on the subject, take the brakes off. I want you to look at this ocean of people under this tabernacle tonight. Could you imagine what presence of God would be in this place it's if each and every one from the front row to the back, from side to side would take the brakes off and let God do everything that he wants to do in your heart and life. Now, I have lived in Mississippi for 30 years, and Mississippi is as flat as this tabernacle. We don't have hills and mountains and valleys. But I have lately moved to Tennessee, and I have yet to find a piece of flat property in the state of Tennessee. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Everybody from Tennessee, one leg is longer than the other where they stood on the side of the mountain all their life. Even in the delivery room at the hospitals, the floor is slanted so the newborns will feel at home when they get here. <laughs> never seen anything like it in my life, so I've had to begin to do something I've never had to do before. Every time you stop and park somewhere, you got to put your emergency brake on. If you don't, you'll find your car four miles down the road somewhere. And so I'm not used to having to put the emergency brake on every time I stop. And so when I get in my car, in spite of the idiot light and the buzzer going off, I still forget to take the emergency brake off sometimes. But it isn't long that I realize something's not right. There's a lack of power there. There's, there's a hold back. You can feel the hindrance. And them brakes get hot. Causes a lot of friction. Could it be that we've got so much friction in our church because so many belly aching backslid Baptists have got the brakes on and are holding back God from doing what he wants to do? But I tell you, I'd like for it to be recorded in heaven that on July 2nd, on a Tuesday night, we met under an old fashioned tabernacle and everybody just took the brakes off and lifted their hearts and hands toward heaven and just decided what one more time, uh, we're going to let God be God. Now I want to show you quickly three times in the Bible that we're guilty of putting the brakes on and I'm through. I've only got 30 minutes. I get paid to preach by the hour and Dr. Arthur only bought 30 minutes to die. Let me give you three times. I think we're guilty of putting the brakes on. Number one, when it comes to people getting saved, I think we put the brakes on a lot of time. You know, the Bible still says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4 that God would have all 
all men to be saved. Do you understand it doesn't matter what lifestyle they've been in? It doesn't matter how far down they are. It doesn't matter how wicked they might be. It doesn't matter how many tattoos they might have. It doesn't matter how many earrings they might have. It doesn't matter how much liquor they consumed. It doesn't matter how many needles have been in their arms. It doesn't matter how many times they've been locked up. It doesn't matter how many times they've had abortion. There's a God up in heaven that's still able to save sinners. And I believe a lot of times in our churches and even our daily activity, we put the brakes on because we look at a certain caliber of people and we say within ourselves, I can't ever imagine something that far gone ever becoming a Christian. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd have saw me 37 years ago before the Lord saved me on that dark November night, November 22nd, 1975, I staggered in the back of a little old Baptist church. My hair was in a ponytail, tattoos up and down my arms, 36 inch bell bottom blue jeans, four inch white platform shoes, and an old dirty t-shirt. But I'm glad God looked way beyond my ponytail. I'm glad God looked way beyond my tattoos. I'm glad God looked way beyond my record. Oh, aren't you glad there's a God up in heaven that can still save sinners? Look at you tonight, bless God Almighty. There was a day you wasn't interested in God. There was a day you wasn't looking for God. It's a wonder you didn't go to hell in your own vomit. You were a God cusser. You were a heathen. You was a rebel. You was an outcast. But look at you tonight. You got a Bible in your lap. You got Jesus in your heart. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad tonight to know Jesus saves sinners? Somebody said, I'd shout, but I'm not worthy. I got news. We're not here tonight, bless God, because we're worthy. We're here tonight because he's worthy. He's worthy. I, uh... Yeah, hallelujah. I, uh, I buy selling I buy and sell and trade stuff on the side for two reasons it's a hobby to keep you from going nuts and Baptist churches will starve you to death so it's either that or go back to selling pot don't laugh I thought about it I'd make a whole lot more money a whole lot less headaches and I'd still meet half of you. So, I buy, I buy selling trade stuff on the side and I, I had a motorcycle I wanted to sell and this fella called me and he said, uh, Preacher, I want that motorcycle. And I said, well, what have you got? You want to buy it? He said, I'd like to trade. He said, I got a sports car, it's convertible, it's candy apple red with a black convertible, and it's an Alfa Romeo, a car made in Italy, and I'd had one years ago. Well, it wasn't mine, I stole it, but I kept it for two months. <laughs> it was an awesome ride. <clears throat> so I said, man, I'd love to have one of them cars like I had back years ago, and so I said, let's meet and we'll talk about it, and I'm thinking this thing's going to be beat up. Dr. Carper rushed around the, 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 the whales and I said the convertible will be shot in rags and maybe he pulled up in that thing. It was as slick as a piece of glass. There wasn't a flaw in that body. That motor was as sound as a brand new one, only had 40,000 original miles on it. I said, yeah, when he puts the convertible up, it'll be nothing but a rag. And he put that thing up and it was flawless. There wasn't a wrinkle one. He said, now, preacher, I'm willing to trade you even this car for that motorcycle. And I thought, man, this guy, I got I to gotta make this deal quick before he sobers up. And so I said, sir, I'll be glad to trade you. I said, have you got a clear title? And he said, yes, sir. I said, well, I have one on the bike. I'll be glad to trade you. We'll trade even. And I said, let me see the title. Here's the title to the bike. And Brother Rose, when he gave me that title, 
stamped in big red letters across the front of it said salvage and I said wait a minute Jack Whoa. I wasn't born yesterday I said why does that say salvage across the title he said I don't know it was on there when I got it I bought it and that's just the way it is I said well wait a minute let me call the courthouse let me see what this means and I'll talk to somebody down there at the title bureau about salvage so I called the lady and I told her the story that I just related to you and I said, lady, this thing said salvage, but I said it's, it, it, it's, it's better looking than when it was brand new. It's been redone inside and out. You can't tell it's ever had a flaw. But I said, can you tell me what salvage means? She said, oh yeah, I can tell you what salvage means. She says it means at one time that car was beyond repair. It was hopeless. It was all bent out of shape. It was all ripped up, burned out, and they throw it in a junkyard. And she said, we don't know why. But every once in a while, somebody will walk through a junkyard and see an old heap of trash like that. And something just moves on their heart to pull it out of all of that trash. Nothing but trash. No value to it at all. And she said they'll put it in that garage. Cut all that old stuff off. Put all stuff in it brand new. And said it's better then than when it come off the assembly line. But we call it salvaged. She said, sir, are you still there? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm still there. She said, do you understand salvage? I said, lady. I understand salvage. 37 years ago, the low down devil had taken everything I had. He had destroyed my life and brought me down to nothing and threw me out on the heaps of condemnation. And I don't know why to this day, lady, but Jesus passed by the mess I was in and pulled me. Do I understand salvage? I am salvage. Did you know I looked the word salvage up in the dictionary? Did you know the very next word after salvage, which means it's the root word added to? You know the next word in your English dictionary after salvage? Salvation. You know what God's saying? Whether you were six years old or 96 years old, when you got saved, God salvaged you. God picked you up out of nothing. Bunch of nobody's headed nowhere. Every one of us ought to be in hell tonight. But aren't you glad we got salvage? Bless his holy name. So take the brakes off when it comes to God saving sinners. I don't care how far gone they are. The hand of God can reach deeper than the stains of sin. Number two. Take the brakes off when it comes to the storms of life. Mark chapter number four, the disciples put the brakes on. They woke Jesus up in that boat that night and said, carest thou not that we perish? Things come upon us unexpectedly. I thought about when I came into the tabernacle tonight, I walked around and tried to greet several hundred people and say hello to as many as I could. Many of you knew me back when I was a 19 year old preacher here in Greenville. And did you know five individuals come up to me in just a few minutes that I shook hands and said, pray for me, I've got cancer. I've got cancer. There's cancer patients all over this tabernacle tonight. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean we don't go through conflict. There's three stages of conflict when storms come our way. First, there's the immediate shock of our conflict. That's the humanity side of us. Just because we're Christian doesn't mean we're human. We're not human. No, but none of us want to get cancer. Nobody wants to have open heart surgery. Nobody wants to have kidney failure. Nobody wants to be a diabetic. Nobody wants to lose their lung, their eyesight. Nobody wants to get Alzheimer's. But we're not exempt from that just because we're Christians. A beautiful lady and couple in this building that I've known since I was a boy 
came up to me tonight and she's leading her husband by the hand and said, Preacher, I wanted you to see him one more time. He doesn't speak anymore and he doesn't even know who I am. We used to shout together and run the aisles and love God and tonight he's here but he doesn't even know me. There's a shock that comes when these things hit us. Then it moves into a stage that I call silence. It's almost like you can't find God. It's, it's like you become numb. It's like you're overwhelmed with the fact that God had let this happen. And then these things move into us because we are human in the shock. We, we begin to question, how could this happen? Why would God let this happen? Then the doubt and the fear and the struggle, all of that is normal. That's normal. It's going to take place. That's normal. But if you will hang on and just sit still in the time of shock, if you will trust him when it seems like he's silent, there's a great calm coming your way. He will step out on the bow of your conflict. And it may not be removed, but when he speaks, it really doesn't matter anymore. Because just to know he can still the storm is enough to revive the faith and the strength that comes through God's divine grace. I don't know what your affliction might be tonight. You might have a wayward daughter or a drunken son. You may have an unsaved husband or an unsaved wife. You may have lost your job. You're losing your health. Your retirement is gone. I hate to tell you, when President Obama talked about change, what he meant was that's all you would have left in your pocket when he got done with this nonsense. You Democrats, look up here. And so there's all kinds of conflicts and problems and heartaches. Somebody said, I go down there and camp means I don't go down there. Only reason why they shout is because everything's going right in their life. Let me save you some time, stupid. We don't shout because everything's going right. We're not rejoicing because everything's going right. As a matter of fact, a lot of us right now, everything's going wrong. But we know if we'll just hang on through the shock and through the silence, there's a great big God that can step out on the edge and speak peace to the child of God. There's much more I want to say, but I want to hurry and close. I want to get to my third point because this takes me back, Dr. Aiken, to being a 19-year-old boy. I think we put the brakes on a lot when it comes to worshiping the Lord and shouting. I never thought I'd see the day when Baptist folk and Christian folk would frown upon people getting excited about God. Some of you have never said a holy hoot in your life. And during the millennial reign, you're going to have to sit in a beginner's class and look at a mirror and say hallelujah for a hundred years. Look at it, some of you, bless God. I don't know if you got Jesus or typhoid fever. You ought to take the brakes off every once in a while. You ought to let the low down devil know whose side you're on. You should never be ashamed to be a child of God. I mean, Brother Shooky, we're only saved forever. We've only been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. We were only on the brink of despair. We were a bunch of nobodies headed nowhere. He's been with us every step of the way. He's comforted us on the journey every time we needed him. He showed up when nobody else ever showed up. And you ask me why I shout, he's worthy. I was, uh, I was in a meeting some time ago, and I don't like going to sites and stuff. When you do this for 37 years, you're not going to take me anywhere that interests me. But I was way out in the country, and a man said, I want to take you somewhere. I said, not interested. I don't like sites. I just want to study. Don't, don't leave me alone. He said, no, I want to take you somewhere you've never been. I said, all right. You know where that idiot took me? And I'd never been. He was right. That idiot took me to a cow auction. <laughs> now you understand, I've never been to an auction. I didn't have any idea what was going on. But there's a Pentecostal fellow had that microphone and he wasn't letting it go for nobody. <laughs> I walked in there and he was going, she's like, 
I'd never heard an auctioneer in my life. So I go in this place and there's a bunch of old cowboys sitting around and they're herding these cattle through, just one after another. And I didn't know it. I didn't know it. But when you move, you're bidding on a cow. You don't move in an auction. You don't scratch your head. You don't dig your nose. You don't do nothing. You're going to buy a cow. I didn't know that. So I'm sitting out there with all them cowboys and them flies are flying around. I'm going like this. <laughs> Finally, the pastor looked over at me and said, Brother, we're in a pinto. How are we going to get three cows to the house? <laughs> I done bought three of them things and didn't even know. And the longer the auction went, the sadder looking the cows got. I mean, they had some come in there that looked like Shetland ponies. Some of them come in there had big knots hanging off of them. And some of them, there's an old cow come through there so cross-eyed, if it had cried, tears would have run down its back. But them old cowboys, they'd bid on it, it didn't matter, they kept bidding on them cows. I said, man, what are they gonna do with that nasty thing? All of a sudden, here come a cow. You could count every rib. It couldn't have weighed 70 pounds. And them cowboys, that guy, that Pentecostal fellow, goes, give me that. He's out here. And them cowboys was bidding away on this nasty looking thing. And he got out in the middle of the arena and died. <laughs> it died in the middle of the arena. Put all four hooves up in the air and its tongue was hanging out. Didn't bother them cowboys. <laughs> I hear one old boy I say, pull your hat up, son, that thing's dead. <laughs> Just kept bidding on him. There's an old cowboy sitting over there on the edge of the fence, and he had a rod in his hand. I didn't know what it was. And he went over there to that dead cow, and he put it on the south end of that northbound cow. And there's a little button right there, Brother Shug. And when he went, eh, and he just, let me tell you something, Bubba. When he hit that button, that cow did the break dance long before Michael Jackson ever thought of it. That cow got up. That cow's a going like that. I started bidding on it. Him and him and him. That preacher said, man, you can't buy that cow. Are you nuts? I said, I want the cow. I want that rod. I've been to a lot of Baptist churches. I've seen a lot of deacons. I've seen a lot of church members. Give me one of them rods, hallelujah. Let me, let me close with this. I, I was a 19 year old boy in the ghetto of a big city. And I asked my probation officer if I could have a weekend leave because I'd heard of Dr. Harold B. Seidler. Somebody give me some of his, of his cassette tapes. I never met him. I told my probation officer, I said, I'd like to go to Greenville. I could never go to college or anything like that, but I'd like to at least see the place. He said, I'll give you a three-day leave, Phil. You get to Greenville and come back. You, you get in trouble, son. I'll put you under the jail. So I came down to Greenville for a couple of days just to meet Dr. Seitler, see the school, and go go back to Ohio. When I got to Greenville, somebody said, Greer, Baptist camp meeting's going on. I said, you ever been to a camp meeting? I said, no, I have any idea what you're talking about. I said, you ever shouted? I said, I have any idea what you're talking about. They said, oh, you gotta go to, you ever met Brother Billy Kelly? I said, never heard of him before in my life. I said, you can't stay in Greenville and not go to Greer. You gotta go to Greer camp meeting. This is 1978. So I came with another friend of mine. This tabernacle was packed. All of this beautiful stuff wasn't here. And folks were sitting on vehicles out around their, this tabernacle. Probably 12, 1,500 people here that night. And I'll never forget, I come in, and you understand, I ain't, I'm not used to all this stuff. This stuff's different. So I come down here, and I sit right over there in the middle section, right across the aisle from an elderly gentleman named Pop Burns. I didn't know Pop Burns. He had his own folding chair, and he was sitting there right across the aisle from me. The Burns Trio, which I didn't know at that time was his family, 
came up here and started singing. I couldn't believe what was happening in this tabernacle. I thought they were yelling at the singers. I told one fellow, I said, hey, shut up. They're, I've heard worse. Sit down and shut your mouth. I said, shut your mouth. Get, just sit down there and shut up. Leave them folks alone. I thought, because one guy said, I said, I'm going to break your neck. You say one more word. I'm going to tell you, I can't shout, but I can fight. I'll break your neck. I had no idea what I'd got into. And I was sitting there, and about that time, this place went wild as a buck. Two or three men were trying to climb them white poles. One of them was like a squirrel. He said, if I get up, I'm going across that rafter. <laughs> At about that time, old Brother Burns was in a folding chair that he had brought, a lawn chair. He stood up. You understand? My first time. He takes that folding chair, puts it on top of his head, and comes down the aisle kicking that salt. I didn't know that as a family singing. I didn't know. And he's kicking that salt us wild as a buck. His eyes are glossed over. He don't even know where he's at. And I told the guy that's with me, I said, he's drunker than a bald owl. <laughs> he's a staggering around with that folding chair over his head. He sat back down and I thought, dear Lord, somebody in that family ought to take better care of that old man. He's going to hurt himself. He's so mad he's ready to throw the chair. I had no idea what was going on. Dr. Harold B. Seidler mounted the pulpit not long after that. Never heard such preaching in my life. Oh, God's power and glory so filled this tabernacle. God came down. I saw men get up, run outside, and shake hands with the bushes. We found one fella up in a tree. He climbed that thing and got his polyester britches hung on a limb. And he looked like a retarded squirrel hanging out of that tree up there. And folks got in the glory. And man, God, the Holy Ghost, showered down on me and the next thing I knew I was on my feet with my hands up in the air and tears are running down my face uh, you know what I did the next night I went over to brother Burns and said would you stand up and I took his chair and put it on my head and come down the aisle with it and I tell you bless God Almighty I've been shouting for 37 years and it's still good and he's still a good God we need some young fellows that'll quit worrying about their girlfriend and getting a wrinkle in their suit and getting sawdust on their shoes. We need some fellows that'll hit the floor and say, blessed be God, I want to keep this a-going. I believe in the old-time way. We ought to just take the brakes off. Worship him because he's worthy. Let me give you this. The Bible said that worship is due to his name. You say, I don't feel like it. Uh, wait a minute. If I only shouted when I felt like it, I probably never would shout again. But it's due to his name. Now, next time your electric bill comes and it's due, next time your electric bill's due, you just say, I don't feel like paying it. I don't feel like paying my electric bill. When your family's sitting around a candle, you'll feel like paying your electric bill. I don't feel like paying my water bill. When the toilet's filled to the brim, you'll feel like paying your water bill. When your family smells like a goat, you'll feel like paying your water bill. You don't pay it because you feel like it. You pay it because it's due. I don't shout all the time because I feel like it. I shout because it's due. He's worthy. I love him more than anything in the world. He's the best thing that ever happened in my life. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Bless you, Doc. I'm sorry. Let's stand together and sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He's worthy tonight. If you're under this tabernacle and you don't know God, you'll never get a better opportunity to be saved. If you're here tonight and God's dealt with you about something in Christian life, you'll never have a better opportunity to get it right. And you might just need to come down here and ask the Lord to forgive you of being so prideful. You don't praise his name. 
You might want to come and just worship God. You got a need? The altar's open. Let's sing out together. Come Give on, him right glory and praise. Here we go. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wreck like me. I once was lost. Come on, take the brakes off. Let God have his way in your life tonight. sing that last verse. If you have a need tonight, you let the Lord come into your heart. Let him save you. Let him help you. If you got a need, you come tonight while we sing this last verse. When we've been there in time.